Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Inside Out on the Road, a show where we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis, deep dive into financials, and also highlight the key risk and triggers going forward. Well, let's get straight to our first stock today. My colleague Sonal gets us a very special deep dive in GE Shipping. Well, we are closer to the year end and Inside Out is on a special location. We are at Gallops in Mumbai and today we'll be focusing on G Shipping. It is India's largest private sector shipping company and transports liquid, gas, solid, bulk products from one country to the other. The company has two business segments, shipping and offshore. Shipping would consist of different carriers and offshore consists of oil rigs and support vessels. There are four types of carriers. Crude carriers, which will carry crude products, product carriers, LPG carriers, and dry bulk carriers, which carry bulk products. The fleet is a very important parameter for any shipping company. And for GE Shipping, in its shipping segment, it has 43 ships of different kinds with an average age of 12.96 years. In the offshore segment, the total fleet is 22. If we talk about the financials now, there is cyclicality because of the way freight rates move. Calendar year 2021 saw freight rates at a 31-year low, and that is something which impacted business. But due to all the supply crunch that we've been talking about, in 2021, freight rates shot up and how? This definitely turned things around. While revenues in six months of FY23 are at 2,800 crore rupees, which compares with 3,500 crore rupees in FY22, company has been able to more than double their profits in six months versus FY22. So the six months profit number is around 1,200 crore rupees. In these revenues, 70 to 75 percent come from international trade and balance from India. But of course, freight rate trade volatility remains a key risk and concern because they can fall from these levels if cycle changes. Management did indicate in quarter two, and I quote, with continuing high inflation and high interest rates, a global recession is possible. This would impact demand for multiple commodities, threatening our market. While this is about the risks, company has been able to maintain momentum when it comes to dividend payout to shareholders. Barring FY19 and FY18 when the company reported losses, dividend payout has been decent. And for the first time ever, company has become net cash, strengthening their balance sheet. Operating in the highly cyclical shipping industry, company's profitability fluctuated wildly at different times, though they have endured four shipping cycles by virtue of its 70-year presence in the industry. So let's take a deep dive into GE Shipping and understand their business. Well, as promised, it's time to take a deep dive into GE Shipping and we are joined by the Group CFO and Executive Director, Mr. Shivakumar. Thank you so much for joining us here on CNBC TV at 18 and this edition of Inside Out. Well, as we were discussing earlier and the fact has been uh, that right now the shipping cycle is extremely strong. We are seeing high levels as far as freight rates is concerned. But how long, according to you, do you think this will continue? Because in quarter two, you had mentioned that the global recession that we are looking at or maybe the commodity prices which are expected to come down could impact business. Uh, what kind uh, of changes are you seeing here? Uh, how do you protect yourself from the volatility that we see in the markets? Uh, good morning, Sonal. Thank you for having me uh, on this interesting yeah. show. Uh, yes, the markets are very strong. Uh, and we've seen that strength in the tanker market for the last couple of quarters. Yes, there is a fear of a recession which could affect uh, demand for tankers going forward. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that impact yet. There is a little bit of a demand overhang uh, in the dry bulk business, which has sort of been drifting lower over the last couple of quarters. I mentioned that earlier as well. Uh, so. Tankers are still really strong. Maybe we'll get some impact of the recession as we go forward. As to your question on how you prepare for the volatility, we can't. You can't prepare for the volatility, mm -hmm. frankly. You have to be able to ride it out. All you can do is to say the markets will go down at some point. And when they go down, you should be prepared for weak markets. And they could be weak for a significant period of time. Over a long period of time, markets will enable you to make money. Yeah. The critical part is you need to survive the downturns in order to take advantage of the upturns. And that's what is our focus. Okay, so in that case, can you just briefly explain to us, you have two segments, shipping and yes. offshore. Uh, how does the business model really work? Because that's something that the investors and the viewers would really like to know. Yeah, so the business model is, the commodity shipping business is a cyclical business. That's the first thing that 
should be kept in mind. And having been in business for 74 years now, we've been through several cycles. The organization remembers that. That's the organization memory. That's what helps us to always go through these markets, keeping some equanimity, that this too shall pass. If it's a strong market, we know that at some point it's going to get weak. If it's a weak market, we know at some point it's going to get strong. So you need to be aware of the cycles. Within the cycles, you will have volatility. So you, you won't just have a one way up. It's like the stock market, right? You can have bad days in a bull market as well. Now the business lends itself to taking debt. It requires you to take debt because it takes so much capital just to buy one ship. If you want to buy a new mid-sized product tanker, typically it'll cost you about 250 crores. Mm. And that's in a reasonable market. Today, it probably costs 350 crores. Mm. So, and you, that's a lot of capital. And you take debt for that. And because it's a dollar business, you can take dollar debt. The problem with taking debt is, in a market like a year ago, EBITDAs on those kind of ships were three to $4,000 a day. Mm. You need much, much bigger earnings in order to meet your mm. uh, debt servicing. Today, the EBITDAs are $45,000 a day. Yeah. The point is you need to go through those mm. periods where without one, having to force sell your mm. ships, and two, if those markets are that bad, you should be able to buy as well, mm. because you need to then build up capacity in the weak markets. So that's what we look at. We keep a lot of cash to enable us to go through bad markets. So that's what we call a risk capital. Mm. That enables us to go through these bad markets and to buy in the bad markets. So that's the broad principle. We buy cheap because that's the one thing you can control. You can't control operating expenses beyond a point. Mm. Most of the costs are sort of fixed. Mm. They are inflexible. You can't do anything about, uh, about the cost of people. 55% uh, of our operating expenses, sometimes 60, are people costs on the ship. Mm. For the people to crew the ships, and they are the ones who are running our assets, mm. they're not very flexible in terms of costs. Mm. And we are okay with that. So you can't control that. You can control your capital cost. Okay. So the idea is to buy cheap, so that you have the lowest break-even, mm. and therefore you're competitive. Okay. That's what we look to do. We keep cash, and there are markets in which you'll collect cash, mm. and you will get times when markets are not cheap, mm. ships are not cheap. You have to wait, mm. and you have to sit on cash and wait, mm. like we are sitting on cash today. Okay. Sometimes it can get a little painful be just sitting on cash and it's earning you know, 2 3% in dollars. Uh, when your ships are uh, making a 20 25% return uh, on capital, but that patience, we know that that patience will pay off mm. eventually. So you, if you're going to be a cycle player, you will have times when you have a lot of leverage and you'll have times like today when you have no leverage. Okay. And you need to live with that because in the knowledge that that's what will pay off for okay. you in the end. So it has brought in a lot of questions what yeah. you just said. So right now is not the right time to buy ships, that's what you're saying. Is it a great time to sell ships because that's something that you did as well? That's right. It is, yes, it is, a, it is in the high part of the cycle. So you would, we are closer to selling than buying. However, we haven't created, we are not happy with the amount of capacity we have. We wish we had more capacity. We would look at selling, yes, a little by little. You can't look at selling out a whole lot. Uh, and we will look at uh, either selling or you can charter out your ship. So you basically sell your capacity. You say that for the next one year, I lock in a rate. You take advantage of the high market easily, by, e either by selling out the ship completely or by locking in some capacity and realizing some of that uh, profit of the sale in the charter period. Okay, so do you have a minimum amount of cash that uh, the company requires to keep? That yes, this much yeah. is the amount that should be in our books any point in yeah. time. So we have something that we define as a risk capital. The risk capital is we model the worst three years in the last 30 years for shipping, mm. for our ships. And we say, therefore, you will make so much EBITDA. Mm. Now, your debt servicing may be $10,000 a day of EBITDA. You may be, the risk case may be 4000 That 6000 is a gap you have to make up. Mm. And that $6,000 a day into the next three years will be kept in cash. So, you know, 75% of revenue is coming from international trade, rest yeah. is from India. Does this keep changing? And right now, is there a difference between the free trades that we've seen in India and abroad? If there is, how much would that be? There's not really much difference. Uh, in the spot markets, every, all the rates are the same. Okay, because it's an international market, it settles. We don't get great preference or anything like that in terms of you don't get a great premium for uh, the Indian market or for the international market. So we go where the rates are best. 
and what are the break even rates for different kind of tankers and what is your uh, mix right now yeah so our uh, fleet consists of seven crude oil tankers uh, 18 product tankers that's ref they carry refined products we call them clean product uh, clean products uh, and four lpg ships plus 14 bulk carriers dry bulk carriers so that's a total of 43 ships uh, typically the fleet break even is somewhere around 11 and a half to 12 thousand dollars per day on a blended basis uh, the gas carriers tend to be a little bit higher than average the crude tankers tend to be sometimes a little bit higher than average because there's more capital cost in them and because their opex is marginally higher but they're all in this range between 10 and 15 thousand dollars a day is the break even okay uh, so you know i was reading some of the updates from quarter two and you did mention that you're looking at modernizing the fleet right yeah. average age is around 12.96 years yeah, in right. the uh, uh, shipping right. segment uh, since you said right now maybe is not the best time to buy yeah. ships then how long will you wait for it yeah. and what is the cash in your books with which you will be buying it or will be you be taking more debt for it now since you're in net cash now yeah so we will it's inefficient not to have debt. So let me answer the last part first. It's inefficient not to have debt in our business. You should take the amount of debt you can afford to take. So we will take debt eventually when we get the opportunity. We will lever up as we did in 2017 uh, when we did a lot of capex. We will wait till the prices are right. And we've seen this in the past. We saw this in the super cycle. We did a lot of investment because we thought this cycle is going to go on forever. You know, this time is different <laughs> kind of thing. That's a mistake. Even if you have to sit on cash for three to five years and then invest at low rates it'll do better than buying at the in a high part of the cycle and we've seen this so what can happen is dry bulk markets are weak right so you may get a chance to buy some dry bulk ships so if we get that and tankers are throwing out cash you allocate it to dry bulk we are in the capital allocation business you allocate it to the dry bulk business then maybe the dry bulk market recovers and produces cash flows which you can then use to buy tankers so in the right uh, kind of cycle or at the top what kind of margins has the company made the um, highest that you would have seen uh, so we've made i think three four years in a row we made 40 percent return on equity mm -hmm. in uh, in 2006 to 2009 mm -hmm. uh, that's a market that's the kind of market that you can have right. even today you know you on a run rate basis we did 1100 crores or so in the first half of the year if you just, I mean, you shouldn't be just, uh, you know, doubling it for the full year, but that's still a 30% plus return on equity, really. So when the markets get very tight, then there's no limit to the rates that you can see. So typically the shipping brokers and researchers say, if you have uh, utilization, that's a world fleet utilization crossing 90, 91%, then the rates just take off. Okay, and then it doesn't matter because there is just a mad scramble for tonnage. Mm. Uh, and the customer will pay whatever it takes to get that ship to lift the cargo. And then it just takes off. Then it doesn't matter whether it's 50000 or $100,000 right. a day. So what is the utilization for your fleet right now? When we talk of utilization, we are basically saying, are our ships all employed mm. uh, with customers or are they waiting for cargoes? Mm. Currently, all the ships are employed okay. or they're just on the way to the... Uh, to the port to load okay so except for the time when they have to be in maintenance in dry dock etc our utilization is normally Usually, how long is the maintenance period of course it's a yeah. big uh, vessel yeah. but yeah typically a dry dock takes between 25 and 50 days depending on the complexity the age the amount of work that you have to put into the ship you have to do a lot of machinery overhaul some of the steel sometimes gets degraded you have to replace the steel you have to paint the ship obviously every time uh, so Typically, a good dry dock will take 20, 25 days uh, and uh, something which requires a lot more work will pro could take up to 50 days. So, uh, how does scrapping work in this market? Uh, yeah. What are the plans for you here? Is it coming at a higher price as well? Scrapping prices are high. They've come off quite a bit in the last couple of months. Uh, so, prices uh, are still quite high. But scrapping is really in relation to what can I make if I run that ship further. And if you're making lots of EBITDA running the ship, uh, you know, to carry cargo, then you wouldn't really scrap the ship. We haven't seen much scrapping happen in the markets over the last four, five years, okay. whether tankers or dry bulk. So all of that is getting built up. And these ships will have to go at some point because they are aging, right? And when that happens, when they actually have to go, then you will find suddenly the supply is constrained. They will typically go when markets are very weak. 
Because if you're making positive EBITDA, you're making decent amount of EBITDA, why scrap the ship? You're making money from that ship. Right? So when you're yeah. basically, the markets are weak, you would look at selling it, that would mean supply crunch, that would mean freight rates going again, That's right. right? That's right. So that is sort of forming a little bit of a safety net for our business. One is that there is a lot of scrapping overhang, mm. ships are getting older, and so ships have to go out at some point. The second is the order book, mm. which is for new ships to join the world fleet, is at two and a half decade lows for tankers. Typically, these tend to be around 12 to 15 percent order book, and these are all at 5 percent now. Okay. So that's a great thing for our business in the sense that the future supply overhang is not there at least. Okay. Okay, since uh, last question, because yeah. you've been in the business for so long and you have told me how do you manage cycles in that yeah. case. Uh, so since clearly freight rates cannot be controlled, that yeah. is in the market's hand. Yeah. Uh, you told me about a lot of costs being fixed. Yeah. Generally, how do you control costs? Because now if you're talking yeah. about uh, maintenance of fleets that yeah. is required, that will incre increase your operating expenditure, right? That's right. So the time is a critical thing here. When I say that it takes, it takes a little more time to do a dry dock than say it used to with more efficiency. That's the one which really time costs money, right? It's a big capital item and that time is very, uh, is critical. In terms of running expenses, you can't really do much. It's a few hundred dollars here and there, few hundred dollars per day here and there. Dry dock expenses are big, chunky expenses. So a dry dock can cost anything between one and a half and three million dollars. There we try to optimize and say that let's try to do minimize the amount of work or the minimize the amount of expense which has to be put into the ship by doing the work on the run. So we do a lot of maintenance on our ships even when they are sailing. So I know it's a forward-looking statement as well, but generally if freight rates remain at this level. You have yeah. already 1,200 crore rupees or 1,300 crore rupees you've done in first half, which is yeah. in terms of profitability, you've surpassed FI22 as That's well. Right. If things remain the way they are, say next two to three years, uh, how will you ensure that the growth remains? Will it be in terms of adding more fleet, more volumes, more orders? What yeah. is something yeah. that you're looking at? If the market remains like this, we won't have growth. Because your capacity will remain the same, we mm. won't be able to buy ships mm. unless you get the opportunity, as I said, in dry bulk. So you could have tanker markets very strong and if dry bulk markets collapse, then you can buy those. Mm -hmm. okay. Otherwise, you won't have growth in profitability. Okay. Then the growth can only come from increased rates. You can only say that the ships which are earning $50,000 a day mm. today, mm. next year they will earn $60,000. Mm. That's the only growth which can come because nothing else is going to change. The number of days will be the same. Uh, Only realization growth, no volume right. growth. No so volume to say. growth. Because unless we buy ships, and we don't have any ships on order, mm. uh, we don't have plans to buy tankers at least mm -hmm. because they're just very high in price. Mm -hmm. The only thing which can be anywhere close to our buying levels is dry bulk, and maybe we'll get to buy those. Okay, but otherwise, there's no growth driver for the profits. Okay, so um, cyclicality is something that makes the business very difficult, but you've been managing it well, Mr. Shivakumar. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us here and explaining what really goes in the shipping business and how you are managing all the cycles that we just spoke about. Well, that's all we have about G Shipping on Inside Out today. Stay tuned for more updates. Well, that was a deep dive into GE Shipping. But we'll slip into a short break. You come back, we'll get you another interesting stock. Venus Pipes and Tubes is the stock on our Swatlight segment. Welcome back. You're tuned into Inside Out here on CNBC TV 18. Well, the stock on our Swatlight segment today is Venus Pipes and Tubes. This is one of the blockbuster IPOs of 2022, as the stock price has more than doubled from its IPO price. Well, they raised 165 crores via the fresh issue in May 2022, and the key utilization of these funds was to use the proceeds to finance project costs for capacity growth, operational cost optimization, manufacturing facility support, and backward integration. Well, the company manufactures stainless steel pipes and tubes, which mainly include seamless and welded stainless pipes. The pipes produced by the company finds it's used in many industries and for Venus, bulk of their revenues comes in from the chemicals and the engineering sectors. Now, due to the CAPEX cycle revival here in India, the share of engineering has increased drastically. Until last year, they were selling majority of their produce in Gujarat, but that has come down substantially as they have focused more on reducing this geographic risk. Now, they have shifted focus to other states as well. Well, the company is following the strategy to diversify across a whole host of states, case in point being Telangana. 
The idea is to give the company a bigger market to play with and hence lower the risk element. The contribution from the seamless pipes has gone up in the first six months of this year. That's because sales are up by more than 70% in the first half if you compare it on a year on year basis. The seamless pipe segment is margin accretive and has two to around 3% higher margins than other categories. Hence the aim is to see that this division contributes more. Well, the financial performance of the company has been solid over the last few years, as the numbers indicate, which are up for you on the screen. The first half of this year as well has been pretty good. Though the margins, well, they are in that vicinity of around 12.5%. Well, earlier in October 2022, the management spoke to us here on CNBC TV 18. They guided for revenue growth of around 20%, that's for FI23, which will be followed by 40% compounded growth over the next few fiscals. They've also guided for margins at around 16% and export contribution doubling to around 20%. But what catches your eye is that they're guiding for 400 basis points margin expansion. Well, let's run you through the key reasons then. The company is adding capacity by nearly around three times. That's by next year. So they'll be well equipped to exploit emerging opportunities in the form of import substitution, higher exports, and huge capex upswing in the domestic markets but this will further be backed up by backward integration. Now, seamless pipe manufacturing depends on mother pipe hollow for final products and also on the quality control in high value items. Venus, well, they have been buying this from third party, but it's now setting up matching piercing line to manufacture its own mother hollow pipes, which once completed can boost the margins in the lucrative seamless pipe division. Well, the management has said that the capex will be approximately 150 crores. Out of that, 40 crores will be debt. The remaining will be funded via internal accruals. And the peak debt will just be around 125 crores, which is not that much for a company that's increasing capacity by 3x. Well, they're on the valuation front, the stock trades at a discount to its larger peer. That's Rathamani Metals, which has some carbon steel pipes exposure. The fear is, what if demand dries up? and the industry doesn't grow by that much, and maybe then that additional capacity finds no takers. But as things stand, earnings are set to bounce back, the company has some valuation comfort, higher capacities, and backward integration will hold them in good stead. Well, we've run out of time on this edition of Inside Out. It's goodbye from Sonal and myself, but do write to us and tell us about companies you want us to discuss, and we'll try to feature them on our show. Thanks so much for watching.